Hey everybody, welcome back. This is week 43 of Creative Come Follow Me for the New Testament. And this week we have a lot of ground to cover. We're going to go from 1 Timothy all the way through Philemon. So 14 chapters of Paul's writings to mostly the leaders of congregations. Where in the past he's been writing directly to a whole congregation. This time he's trying to empower the leaders of certain groups to give them the strength they need to fight off apostasy and to still lead people towards Jesus Christ. And I just felt like they call these the pastoral epistles because they're written to, to those like leaders of the flocks. But I felt like they were like a letter home, you know, like when a missionary writes to tell you how hard their mission is and how much they're struggling, this is the letter that a parent writes back to say, you're fighting the good fight. Stay with it. Even if things seem dark, there's hope in Christ. Let me focus your attention on what will empower you. Because that's basically what Paul does. He focuses on what will empower men like Timothy and Titus to be leaders in a situation that is growing increasingly dark. And the way he does that repeatedly is to focus on the power of the word. He calls it sound words many times this week. It just I think there's this understanding of there really is only one way back home. There is this powerful guidepost that we find in the word. And if we will hold tight to it, we can navigate through all kinds of hard waters. The other thing I would tell you is this week felt a lot like the transition you see between Mormon and Moroni to me, maybe because that's what I've been studying for, for my YSA calling, but I, I've been deep into Mormon's words and you can hear similar tones. You can hear Mormon understand that the world that he's leaving Moroni in is going to get increasingly dark and that no matter what happens in the world around Moroni, he himself, Moroni, can be strong. I feel like that's what missionary parents are writing to their kids as well. Like no matter what your circumstances are or how hard your companion is or how many people you're able to actually get to open the door. You yourself can grow. You can find hope in Christ. There's peace here. Let me show you how. And I think you'll see that throughout Paul's messages, no matter who he's writing to. And I just think he does it beautifully. So even though we have a lot of ground to cover, I promise it's worth your time. I would tell you that since we have so much to go over, I won't be able to cover it all in the videos and the podcast, but I did cover it pretty extensively in the notes. I think there's 45, maybe 46 pages of notes so that if there's a certain area that, you know, grabs you or you feel like we missed a piece, go in the notes and hopefully you'll find some links out to conference talks and BYU devotionals that will help you understand it just a little bit better. But otherwise, let's get started, you guys. Paul always begins his epistles in the same place with this outpouring of love and support and mercy and kindness and prayer. And then here's some things I want you to work on. I just think he's, he's an incredibly kind, good leader, and he loves Timothy. In fact, probably the reason I think Mormon to Moroni so often when I read Paul to Timothy is because he calls him his son, his son in the faith. He's not actually his son. He's just somebody who's been Paul's junior companion of sorts for many of his missions. I think they met on Paul's second mission and he's been with him ever since. So they're close. And now Paul has to be separate from him because Paul's still writing from some form of prison and Timothy is over the saints in Ephesus. He's kind of a a stake president or an area authority of sorts, and he's got some struggles. You know, he's a leader that has some of the people who are working with him, teaching false doctrines and leading people's hearts astray. And he's scrambling a little bit. And I think he misses Paul (laughs) the same way all of us would miss having someone like Paul close by that you could confide in. And so he, he is trying to answer Timothy's questions. What I love is where he begins. So in three, he says, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Paul's big advice in almost every chapter this week is to focus on sound doctrine. This is really powerful to me coming from somebody like Paul, because he has a lot of understanding and a lot of knowledge, right? Especially if this is at the end of his life, which is what most people think. He's seen things that no one else has seen. He probably understands doctrines that other people haven't put together yet. Like he has, he's had a close relationship with the Savior and I just think he's, he knows things. But what he chooses to teach is the exact same thing our prophet and apostles choose to teach. They teach sound doctrine of Christ. They teach about baptism. They teach about repentance. They teach about the gift of the Holy Ghost and enduring to the end. And 
that's what they teach. I mean, they each have their own spin on things and they use their personalities to make things warm and empathic, but they teach the same message. And that's Paul's guidance to Timothy. Charge every one of the people who's in this structure of the church to focus on the word of God. And then he tells you why there's been issues. So if you look in six, it says, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. Okay, I thought this word choice was really interesting. Uh, this swerve is just this very gentle, you know, departure. And then once that swerve doesn't throw them completely off, I think that's when you get confident and you turn aside. The visual that came to my mind as I was studying this, so as a family, just a few days ago, we went to go see Gran Turismo, which is this movie all about race car driving. And the winner of the race, or the guy that you're rooting for in the middle of the movie, one of his strategies is to stop taking the course that everybody else takes. He can see these little dots light up on the track and everybody else takes this one line and he decides he should take this other line. It doesn't work every time, but he's going to just try it and see. And because he does that, he gets this advantage, you know? And I just think that's, as teachers, sometimes I we get into that zone. I know I do, where you're just, you want to do something new. You want to create something fresh or come up with something that's never been taught before. And it's really easy to go from a slight swerve to vain janglings. And that's where things fall apart. I think that's the risk Paul's trying to teach about is he's saying, this is not your doctrine. What makes me very different from the guy in that movie is I am as a teacher. Well, in fact, you can see it in the phrase when it says in seven, desiring to be teachers of the law. When I get into that headspace, it's because I want to be a really good teacher. And what I think Paul's inviting all of them, all those who teach in the gospel to do is to be a good servant of God instead. If you are a good servant of God, you'll teach his doctrine. You'll teach it his way. You'll teach it the way it's been demonstrated in scripture. And by living prophets, you will not add or, you know, have truth mingled with scripture. You'll, you'll focus in. And I just think there's power in that. There's a great talk from David McConkie. It's in the notes where he talks about how this is tempting and how we can avoid it and how we can do the best we can to avoid this swerve that, that gives us confidence to depart even further. Because I think the risk is what we've read about many times before, right? If I just do a gentle swerve or maybe turn slightly aside, the people that I teach or the generations that come after me expand that stretch and end up farther and farther off the path. So he warns to stay a diligent teacher of the word, which means I'm here as a servant of God and that I teach what he would have me teach, not my own interpretations. So it's a, it's a checkpoint that I have to constantly watch for. Okay, in nine, you're going to see some other guidance. This is where he starts to talk about um, the law. In these verses, he's talking about the law of Moses specifically. So he's saying that there was a purpose for the law, like a schoolmaster, like we've talked about in the past, and now they need to refocus. I do love where Paul goes next, because at the end of this chapter, he basically focuses on himself, and he says, I'm an example of how this can work. So if you look in 12, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful and putting me into the ministry. And then in 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and a worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul, even though he is, I mean, this is the end of his life, you guys. He's been a diligent servant of God for decades and still holds himself as an example of, look how far I have come. What I loved about that is I'm right in the middle in the Book of Mormon where I'm reading about when Alma the Younger and the sons of Mosiah get back together and they talk about the miracle that has happened in the Lamanites and how grateful they are to be a part of it. And this sounds like Alma to me. Like he remembers who he was before. He remembers the damage he caused to the faith. And it's not that he dwells on that, you know, mistake ridden past. He sees it as a way to give himself fuel to say, look how much I've been forgiven. I want that joy for everybody else. And I think that's what Paul tries to do throughout his life. He's not throwing his sinful past back at us to bring it back out of the dust. He's saying, if this can work for me as an apostle of Jesus Christ, this gospel can work for you. And so that's what he focuses on. He focuses on the hope that is in this testimony of Jesus Christ. And I think that's where he wants Timothy to focus too.
in chapter two, Paul has some advice to the saints on how to come closer to Christ. One of his first ones I thought was interesting. We've seen it in epistles in the past, but I liked his rationale in this one. So he basically encourages us to be good citizens, at least those in Ephesus. He's saying, be good citizens, be loyal to whoever is ruling over you. And then he talks about why. So if you look in verse three and four of chapter two, it says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. This is, I think, why he hopes for us to be peacemakers. No matter where we live and what's happening in our world, why we should set down contention and find ways to come together because it gives you the best chance of having joy in this life and eternal life in the life to come. I think the more peace we can create on this planet, the more we can get the gospel to as many hearts as possible. We can People can make ordinances or make covenants in this life and they can participate in ordinances and have a lasting peace. I just think that's his hope for all of his people. And there are contingency plans and there are ways to do things by proxy if that doesn't work out. But I do think there is a constant hope for a global peace and we should push for it. We should do what we can to help. The key to finding that peace is what you see in five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The more people we can teach and help understand about the role of Jesus Christ, who he is and the grace he offers us, the farther peace can stretch, you know, that it can cover things like a blanket and heal what is broken. In fact, I really love, there's a great talk from Sister Wright where she talked about Christ as this healer and that he heals broken relationships. And one of the most pivotal relationships he heals is the relationship between us and our heavenly father, that he is this mediator who helps us come back to him. I just think it's beautiful. You can find it in the notes. And then he has some guidance towards men and women. I, I will warn you, this is one of those minefield kind of sections of scripture. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but there's a lot more in the notes. It's just one of those places where I think you want to continually have modern revelation in your ear so that you can read it with a different lens. And I'm not pretending that my version of what I understand is the right way. It's just one of the ways I think you can read these words. Because basically Paul has guidance to men and then a lot more to women. So he starts out with men and he says in eight, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That's his guidance to men. His guidance is pray always, pray everywhere, and don't get angry and don't get, you know, doubtful. Keep yourself strong in the faith. His guidance to women is similar, but a little bit different. He starts by talking about our apparel. And he says, you need to be cautious in your apparel. Not too dissimilar from what we read in the Book of Mormon, where every time you read about costly apparel, pride creeps in. So that's where he warns about. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. I like his reason in 10. He says, but which becometh a woman professing godliness with good works. I don't think Paul is just hoping to make women plain. <laughs> I think his goal here is if you can set all that down, then you can focus on godliness. You can focus on doing good works. I, I just think it's one of those, I think he's speaking to the weak points of men and women. He's saying, men, don't give in to wrath and don't give in to your pride pray differently. Women, don't give in to these tendencies that you have to love these extra things and focus on those. Again, I'm not pretending that this is written to our day. This is certainly written to the people in Timothy's day. But I think the guidance is good. For me, what I thought was powerful was this understanding of don't grapple for self-worth and power in these artificial ways. Men, don't find power in your pride. Don't find power in your ability to be strong and full of wrath. Women, don't seek for power from what you look like or how you put on an appearance to others. Find a deeper sort of power. And that's where I think he goes next. So he has these tricky verses that talk about women being in silence, which you read and it's like ice in your ears because <laughs> it just doesn't fit with anything you heard from prophets. And so you struggle, right? So it says in 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Okay, so the first time I read these, I was like, okay, I think I can completely discount these verses. <laughs> the same way, you know, we talked about in 1 Corinthians. But then I was like, maybe there's more. And again, this is just my theory here, but I think when you read these in tandem with some of the words we've heard from our prophet and from women like Sister Bingham, to me, I read this as saying to claim self-worth and to claim 
real power. You don't need to try to sound like men. You don't need to try to be like men. Women do something different. The reason this sparked in my mind is if you look in the footnotes, it talks about that word silence being something about tranquility and quietness. I think it's not so much not to speak as it is don't try to speak as the men do. Speak with your own divine capabilities. Use your own beautiful feminine voice to teach truth. And no matter what that actually sounds like in the real world, let it be with tranquility. Let it be something that you chose. I just think sometimes either we try to, this is me projecting, but I try to seek power based on my appearance, or I try to seek power based on playing the rules that other people play. And I think sometimes what he's inviting you to do is be divine women of God. You have specific attributes and talents, you should embrace those and speak with that voice. And where we find real power is when we do that in tandem with the men of God around us. I think that's what Sister Bingham taught. In fact, you can go in the notes and learn more about this, but I loved her message of that's what Adam and Eve exemplified from the very beginning, that there is this relationship between them and they work together. When women of God who understand their divine capabilities and their, and are not trying to grapple for power stand with men of God who understand their divine capabilities and are also not trying to grapple for power. When we work in tandem, amazing, miraculous things can happen. We are designed to work together in a harmonious way, not as exact duplicates of each other. And I, I think, I mean, you have to, you have to pull back the layers a little bit to see it. But I think for me, I found beauty in those verses by understanding what I've been taught from President Nelson, from Sister Bingham, I think there's power in that unity that comes from being distinct and different and working in tandem. In chapter three, Paul gives some advice to Timothy on how to find other good leaders. He's going to need to find bishops. Remember, he's kind of a stake or maybe even an area authority type of role, and he's going to need some men to put over these flocks. So Paul has some words on how to find good men who can be bishops. And I just love his guidance. It feels like every bishop we've had, you know, they just have these kind of qualities, these Christ-like tendencies that just rise to the surface when they're actually in that role and have that mantle. So it starts in verse one, it talks about their desires. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. I don't think it's wrong to hope to get that calling or to hope to get any other calling. I think what it says to the Lord is, if you need me, I'll make myself ready. In fact, I'm going to make myself ready now in case you need me. <laughs> I just think there's nothing wrong with that. I think what's where we trip up on things is if we start to try and campaign for it, or we say to the Lord, unless I get this calling, I'm not coming back. But I think hoping for a calling like that is a, it says something good about your heart because it means you hope to be worthy of it. And you're willing to go through that, you know, refiner's fire in order to be all these other things. So if you look in the verses, it talks about some of the other characteristics of what a bishop needs to be. Blameless, a husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And then it talks about a bunch of things you're not supposed to be, like greedy or a striker or any of those things. And then he talks about how you need to be in charge of your house and manage it well, rule it well, and how that will transfer. Because if you can't manage your own house, how are you going to manage the Lord's house? And I just think there's some good guidance in there. But I like that his message is one of, this is the kind of man you're seeking for. What I think is beautiful about this particular calling is I think you don't have to be great at all these things before you begin. I think what you have to be is humble. <laughs> I think you have to be teachable and aware of all your weaknesses and say, oh, okay, I'm in. And where I am weak, I trust you can help me become strong. I saw this firsthand with Jason. So he served as bishop in our ward for six years, mostly during his cancer years. And it was fun to see these little transformations in him. He didn't have any major work that needed to be done, but like things that are in here, like someone who's given to hospitality. I, I may have told you this before, but Jason hated ward parties for years. He just, not that he hated being around the ward. It was just like, by the time he was done with the work and all the other things, like he just wanted to sit. So the idea of getting all dressed up in Halloween costumes and going to eat chili that he doesn't eat anyway, didn't appeal to him. And it was so interesting to me to watch the transition that happened when he was a bishop, because all of a sudden he was kind of pulling me to go to the ward parties. And at first I thought maybe it was out of duty. And then I started to realize, oh no, he just really cares. Like he legitimately wants to see these people the way I had for years before, <laughs> you know, like I knew the people and I was like, no, we have to go. Those, these are our friends. We don't get to see them very often. Let's go. And Jason started to get that same 
feel. You know, he, he wanted to check on people that he didn't see very often. He wanted to be around primary kids because they light him up inside. Like he started to love that piece where he was not given to hospitality before his calling. I think that mantle of being a bishop gave him that gift. And, and that's what I think Timothy's supposed to watch for. Not so much to find a perfect man who's graded all this beforehand, but to find someone who's teachable, who who can change because of the mantle that is given. And I think there's a power in that. So sometimes when you see somebody called as a bishop who's unexpected um, or doesn't seem to have all these traits lined up, I think you can trust that this is a refining process and they're worthy and therefore they, they can go forward. I just think there's power in that. And then he talks about where their testimony needs to be and the love of the word that they need to have. I like where Paul goes next. Around 15, he talks about what to do when you, if I'm not close. So what Timothy hopes for is that Paul will be able to come in person and help him, I'm sure. And what Paul writes is that might not be possible. If I can't come to you, here's where you need to turn. So in 15, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the word, in the world, received up into glory. I think what Paul is saying is, if I can't be with you, you don't need me. <laughs> what you need is the word, especially the word that's this word, this word about who is our savior. He came to this earth. He is a, he came and lived on this earth. He lived perfectly on this earth. He taught to the Gentiles. He did good works. He was seen of angels. He was resurrected. Like all those things he has ascended. If you can bear that testimony and know that solidly and teach it to others, then you'll have everything you need and you don't need to be afraid. I think much like Joseph Smith in his young years, one of the reasons people discounted Timothy is because of his youth. And it's an obstacle he's going to deal with over and over again, both outside of the church and even within it, people who despise his youth. And so Paul has some good guidelines for him. First, he gives him some pretty clear direction. As an authorized representative of Jesus Christ with keys, he says, let me tell you something the Holy Ghost has taught me expressly. I really like his word choice. It's in one he says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This is not something that's a subtle impression that he's received from the Holy Ghost. This is something he knows expressly. I think it's one of the gifts of having those keys is that he can know this for certain about the future. And so he's warning Timothy, look, this is coming. I wonder sometimes if the reason he says it is the same way Mormon said it to Moroni as a way to say like, this isn't your fault. <laughs> You're going to see this play out. It's not your fault. You're going to live as diligently as you can. You're going to suffer persecutions. And please know that this is just where the future is going to go. But this is not so much about everybody else. This is about where will you stand and how will you do what God has asked you to do. So that's what you're going to see in four. So it gives him some guidance on how he can do it. One that I love in the same theme we've seen over and over again is in six. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, that thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. I think for me, this is Paul saying the strategy is not to learn all the false doctrines that are out there and to try and come up with the exact right verse to you know combat them. The, the strategy that will really save is to teach truth. It's what we see in the Book of Mormon over and over again, right? Alma teaches that very clearly that it, even if you want to change an entire people's hearts, what you do is you teach the word clearly and with purpose. That's where Timothy's going to find relief, as if he nourishes himself in the word. But refuse pray, profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyselves rather unto godliness. This is uh, Paul's guidance of like, don't get caught up in all the other means to salvation that people preach. You know, they might preach salvation that comes from your genealogy. That means like, well, you're of this line and therefore for sure you're going to make it. Or ideas about your body and this idea of I'm going to abstain from certain foods like meats or certain fruits or whatever. And that will give me access to a more holier version of me. He's like, set all of that down and exercise rather unto godliness. Focus on the things that will spiritually stretch you and strengthen you and create a workout program for the hosts. You know, don't don't get to temporary benefits from all these other areas in the place of 
finding the lasting benefit that comes from understanding the word. So that's where he focuses. And then in 10, he warns about what's coming. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. I thought this was a very clear statement of like, because you believe, you're going to suffer persecutions. Like they just go hand in hand. I think it's the same thing we heard from President Nelson lately. This this world is going to get a little bit darker in certain areas, and that means you're going to suffer reproach because of what you believe. But don't let that hold you back, because when you, you can take comfort in the fact that you're in really, really good company. You know, even the Savior himself suffered at the hands of men and was mocked and spit upon and judged and condemned. And you're in good company. Some of the best people that have ever walked this earth are among those who suffered for the cause of Christ. So I think that's what he hopes to teach Timothy. In 12, he says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Remember, this is Paul's repeated message. Until I can be with you to give you my counsel as an apostle of God, study the word. Don't let anybody despise you. To me, this is the same guidance. I read a beautiful talk from Elder Anderson this week, studying for my other class. And it was all about choosing not to be offended and choosing not to be ashamed. But those are conscious choices we make. There's some of this in the notes if you want to look for it. But that it's not something people force on us. If we feel ashamed, it's because we chose to let that happen. If people mock us and taunt us from the great and spacious building, we can choose to heed them not. That's what Nephi did. We, when there is temptation that comes our way, we can choose to heed it not the way the Savior did. I just think it's our choice. He wants to empower us. And so that's what he guides him to. He's like, don't let people mess with your head. You stay focused on the word and you will feel empowered. The more I study the word, the less the great and spacious building matters to me. <laughs> the more plastic and, you know, it starts to look like Barbie dream house to me. <laughs> like you just, it doesn't even appeal to me in the same way it used to, the more I come to understand the word. I'm not perfect at it yet. And there's a lot of things I still, weak things that still appeal to me, but I just think that's his guidance. He's like, study the word and then you'll see more clearly. So then in 14, I love the way this is phrased. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of of the presbytery. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That idea of stirring up the gift and neglecting not the gift is, I think, the same thing that Elder Stevenson taught in conference. This idea of spiritual gifts being these things that are going to need some assembly. You know, I was on the Magnify podcast this week and we talked a lot about this, but this idea of that some gifts need to be assembled and they take time to put together, but don't neglect them. Don't leave them out on your porch just because they seem hard to put together. Bring those gifts in and open them up and try to put them to work. The gifts that are in Timothy right now are things like the gift of the Holy Ghost that can guide him. He has gifts like he's heard from Paul and been taught by Paul what is true, and he can hold on to that gift. Even gifts like The keys that he has as this stake leader of sorts that he can use to benefit himself and all that will hear him. Those are the gifts that are sitting within him that when Timothy chooses to use and activate, they can create miracles for himself and for everybody who possibly hears him. Chapter five is a little more focused on the ecclesiastical structure and what what Timothy needs to do to keep things humming. A big piece of that will be understanding the welfare system, how they're going to take care of people like widows and orphans and what what to do, who gets help and who doesn't, and how to manage those funds. Those must be big questions weighing on his mind. So Paul gives him some advice. I think what's cool is where Paul begins. So in the first couple of verses, he says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren, the elder woman as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. Basically, he's saying like, treat these people like family. In fact, encourage them to treat each other like family. The reason I like that is we take care of family. You know, that's kind of ingrained in us that we take care of our own. And so if you see your brothers and sisters in the faith, you will reach out and you'll help and you'll lift. I think it also implies a certain degree of 
patience and forgiveness and mercy. You know, you've probably never forgiven anyone as often as you've forgiven your own family. You've probably never been forgiven as often as you have by your own family. That's, I think, what the nature of this gospel is supposed to feel like. We take care of each other. We extend as much mercy as we can. And we just say, you know, we're in this for the long haul. Let's keep going. So that's where he begins. Before you even get into the nuts and bolts of who gets what money and when, you got to teach each other to teach everyone to see each other as family. And then he gives more specifics on how to know who can get help, who can get financial assistance. I don't go into this a lot. I'm not going to do it in the videos, but I do put it out in the notes. You can find more details about how they decide which widows need help and you know which ones don't and guidance to young widows versus widows who are older. And you can find all that in the notes. But for our purposes, I thought we would shift to what you see at the end. To so the end of this chapter, after he talks about widows and welfare, he does talk about how there are some who are in the ministry who are going to need support. It's similar to what we saw in the Doctrine and Covenants when men were out on full-time missions for years at a time. Sometimes the church would financially contribute to their families in order to, for that to even be possible, right? That, you see some of that in Paul's day. You also see this guidance about how to set apart and how to choose who's going to be called to certain callings. I just thought it was beautiful and it had these lovely echoes of the Old Testament. So he basically says in 21, I charge thee before God, meaning like you are accountable to God for understanding this, that the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, and thou, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. One of the, I think, difficult things to be in Timothy's position is he needs to do everything completely fair. And man, that's hard to do in this mortal world, which is why I think he needs such a profound understanding of the word and access to the gift of revelation and discernment. Thankfully, a lot of that comes with those mantles, right? That you have this ability to discern needs and see things. In fact, you can find some cool quotes in the notes about that. But I think he has to be conscious of that accountability. He's accountable for God for how these funds are used and for how callings go out to people. And partiality can't play a role. So I love what it says in 22. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. And then he talks about seeing the good in anybody, like almost not judging a book by its cover. So it says, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. To me, this is him saying like, don't go in with assumptions. I think this is, you know, the same way, like when we're getting a new state presidency, everybody has theories about who it's going to be, right? We all have these assumptions. But the men who came, the area authorities who came, and the general authority who came and spoke to us the day that we got our new awesome state presidency, and they talked about that experience that they had, they related it back to Samuel in the Old Testament. That's why this sparked in my mind today. Because when he spoke about choosing our awesome state president, they basically said this. He said, you know how in the Old Testament, when Samuel goes to the sons of Jesse, and he thinks it's going to be the older son, and then he gets guidance from the spirit that, you know, don't assume things. Look on the heart. That's where the Lord looks. And that's when he finally chooses David because that's who God chose. And so that's what he basically said about our state president, that he was someone that God chose and that it was abundantly clear, not because of any of his assumptions walking into the room or about anybody else, but just that he knew that that's who God chose and that the two of them together felt it in tandem is two witnesses, right? I just thought... It was such a powerful way to begin a state presidency for all the congregants who were there. Like I found myself rallying like, okay, they're the guy, let's go. You know, like I just think that it, there's power in that understanding of I'm here to do God's work. What does God want done? I'm not going to come with assumptions. I'm not going to assume that because this guy has this checkered past, he can't possibly be a bishop or because this person was off covenant path for so long, they can't possibly be the young woman's secretary, like, I'm going to come to each of these situations and say to the Lord, whom would you call? And I will do what you say. And I think there's power that comes into your calling and into theirs when you tap into that strength. Paul has more guidance about not being distracted by false doctrines. In fact, exhorting those who are leading to teach truth clearly. He says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, this is in verse three, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, and evil, evil surmisings. 
I like this, given the political climate of our day, I think there are a lot of evil surmisings. I think it just, when we feed on contention and it becomes something we're constantly watching for, you find it. And it's almost like our attention fans the flame and that contention and strife just ignites and gets bigger. And so I think he warns about fleeing from all of that. In fact, he talks, there's a phrase he uses in five that I particularly like. It says, they suppose that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. This idea of what our mortal world around us sees as valuable is not what is valuable to God. It will not help you. It will not strengthen you. Don't see wealth or popularity or growth and think, wow, they must be favored by God. Those don't always go together. Even when it comes to being a teacher, you know, I might be a really popular teacher. That doesn't necessarily mean I am close to the spirit. <laughs> it might mean I'm entertaining. It might mean I'm really good at keeping people engaged. There, there's a difference. And so Paul's trying to caution him, like, be watchful of those who are leading and teaching that they teach sound doctrine, doctrine that could have been spoken by Jesus Christ and would be if he were here. I think that's what he means in verse three. And then he warns him to withdraw. And he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Where the world would tell you that it's all those other measurable factors, what really is gain is godliness with contentment. I love this phrase. I don't know that I've ever read it before, but I like the idea of being content. It's not so much, I think, passive. Sometimes I think contentment is like, okay, I guess I'll just take whatever comes. I think contentment is purposeful. It means I trust that God has a plan for me, that no matter what my circumstances look like, no matter where he's placed me or what my stewardship is at this point in time, I can trust that he has a purpose for it or that he can make all things work together for my good. That's, I think, his goal here. That's what contentment is. It's the same thing we see with Alma. Remember in the Book of Mormon when he wants to shout out with the trump to tell everybody about the goodness of Jesus Christ because he knows it personally himself and he's seen it bless the Lamanites and he's like, I want to just say this to everyone. And then he almost corrects himself, you know, and says, but, but I, I sin in that wish because he needs to be content with the stewardship that he's been given and the vocal range that he has. And I think that's what the Lord is trying to say to us and to Timothy through Paul. Choose to be content with where God has placed you and you'll find growth. You'll find power. And then he warns about a very common obstacle, and that is the love of money. So if you look in verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And then in 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. I think the idea that you pierce yourself with great sorrow is particularly poignant. It, when we let the love of money or the power that money can buy or the popularity that money can buy um, become our what we worship, that's where we run into problems. You know, when President Nelson talked about different addictions and how they become what we worship, I think the same thing happens with money because we start to feel like money is what fuels my popularity and it fuels my power. And so therefore I need more of it. And so we start to place that over those great commandments. We place it over taking care of our fellow men and then we place it over God himself and we lose focus. So he says, Fall after none of those. Flee these things, is what he says in verse 11. And then he encourages them in 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called. Thou hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a low bar. Paul is saying to Timothy, like, I am charging you as a man of God who is capable of keeping this commandment and these directions to keep it until Christ comes back. Like, be this, you know, beacon to other people. That's what Paul needs Timothy to be. He needs him to be strong and forthright and clear eyed. And he's given them the tools to do it. And those are the same tools that the Savior gave his apostles. Like, these are clear tools to accomplish it. Know the word, stay close to the spirit and teach it without offense or shame. And then you'll have power. So in 17, he gives them other guidance. He says, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. 
that they do good and that they enrich in good works, they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. The reason I like this edition, sometimes we just focus on the love of money and it's that it's the root of evil. The reason I like reading it with these other verses, I think this makes it clear that the money itself is not the evil. There are lots of people who have an abundance of wealth who do good and are good. And I think you see how. If, like what you see in 18, well, first starting in 17, it says that you don't get high-minded. If you still have a stance of humility and you still take care of your fellow men and do what you can to serve and bless, you avoid becoming high-minded. I think in 18, do good. When you choose to do good with the rich blessings God has given you, communities thrive. We see that in the Book of Mormon. There's a few key places where the people are faithful and then their wealth increases and they stay faithful. And I think a big reason they accomplish it is what you see in 18. They are ready to distribute and willing to communicate. They, I think, when you can get in the stance of, this is not my wealth. This is wealth that has been allotted to me. It's my stewardship. And my job is to take care of it and grow it as I can in a righteous way and do good. Be willing and ready to distribute and consecrate my funds wherever they are needed. And be willing to communicate. Where can I help? What can I do? What can I do that's beyond maybe even what you asked? How can I be of the most good with these blessings I've been given? I think if you can do that, then you avoid that that trap that comes with the love of money. It becomes you're a person who has money, who loves God first and their fellow men next and wishes to use that those funds to bless in any way possible. Of all the reading this week, 2 Timothy is probably my favorite. Although, I don't know, I kind of love Philemon too. But especially this first chapter, I think there's so much packed into this very first part of Paul's epistle to Timothy. So this is the second one. This is where most scholars think this is the last written epistle of Paul. There's some question about the authorship, as there always is with Paul's writings. But I think this is this is Paul's heart. You know, this is potentially his very last epistle to this son of faith that he loves. And it's tender. This is him hoping for the best for Timothy and showing him how to access faith, faith that will hold you. And so if you start in chapter one, you can see it right from the get-go. He talks about his love of Timothy and how he hopes for the grace and goodness of God to flow towards him. He reminds him that he's been praying for him all this time. And then in four, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. I don't, I don't exactly know what this means, but I kind of love the fact that Paul knows Timothy's heart. I, I, this might be me putting my own spin on things, but I think Timothy's job is hard. I think of Timothy like I thought about Edward Partridge in the Doctrine and Covenants. Like he's that first bishop who has so much weight on his shoulders. And I think Joseph loved him for that, that he tried so diligently to do his work. And it literally wore him down. I just think that's Timothy. And so Paul knows that he's going to have nights that are full of tears where things just don't go well and struggle is real for Timothy. And I think that softens Paul. I think he finds joy in that because he knows who Timothy is becoming in this adversity. The same way, like when I hear Jason talk, you know, he laughs because I don't cry very much in church talks, but he, he gets choked up often, kind of like President Irene a little. <laughs> he's, he just can't help himself because he loves abundantly and it shows on his face. And I rejoice when that happens because I feel like it's so tender. It, found, it sounds full and real to me. His testimony is even more poignant in those moments for me. Uh, I think that's maybe where Paul is. He, he's grateful for the love that Timothy has for this work and for the Savior, and he can, he can feel it. And then he talks about where Timothy got this strength. It's interesting because you would assume it's all coming from Paul, from being this apostle's junior companion for however long. You would think that's where his strength comes from. But where Paul gives the credit is to his mother and his grandmother. So if you can see in verse 5, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded in that in thee also. We don't know the backstory of these two women other than the fact that they are Jews. We know that his mother was a Jewess and that she came to the faith. And that his grandmother came to the faith. And I don't know if that means they taught Timothy about the Christian faith, or if it means that they did such a great job teaching him scripture as a Jewish boy growing up, that when they converted, he was ready. You know, the same way Paul studied scripture as a Pharisee for 
you know, his whole early life and then was ready to teach truth once things were clear. I just think it's cool the way he focuses attention there. I think he's trying to say to Timothy, you don't need me per se. You need, you, he's been building up for a long, long time. You don't just need a connection with me. You need a connection with God. And look, you've had that from the beginning, thanks to these mighty women in your past. I just think they're like the stripling warrior mothers to me. You know, they taught him the gospel, at least what they understood as far as they understood it, until new light and knowledge came. And then they taught him that too. And that that created this foundation that then Paul could build on. And I just think that's powerful. I love what you see in six and seven. These are some of the best verses in all of this week's study. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by putting, by, by the putting on of my hands. For God hath, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. This is a stance of courage and clarity. Paul knows who he is, and he wants Timothy to have that same surety. God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. He gives us a power and love and a sound mind. That's what Paul wants Timothy to remember. It's the same feel I get when I read my patriarchal blessing. You know, there is that I am much more eternal than sometimes I give myself credit for, <laughs> that I have gifts and talents that are right under the surface that I haven't even explored yet, that there, he sees me and he's like, Maria, don't be afraid. We'll talk about this in the object lessons too, but I love that this is one of those commandments that is all over scripture. You know, fear not is all over the place. You know, we saw it when we talked about the nativity story, you see it all over the Book of Mormon in the Doctrine and Covenants. Fear not. This is, you are in good hands. And so that's his guidance. Trust in the power and the sound mind that comes when you are solidly rooted. And then in nine, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Jesus, in Christ Jesus before the world began. The reason I like this in nine is I think this is Paul's reminder to Timothy that like, you didn't earn this calling. I mean, you have to be worthy in order to be in the position that he's in. But he, this is not about who you, what you did in order to get here. The same way when you listen to the members of the Quorum of the Twelve talk about their life before they were called. Like they're, they're like, well, I'm not special. There's nothing about me that makes me have this calling. All of it comes from the grace of Jesus Christ. He, this is his purpose and his work and he placed me here. I didn't earn this spot in any way. I think that's what Paul's trying to teach Timothy. So that when Paul is gone and Timothy starts to doubt and wonder, he can rest on that assurance. And then Paul reaffirms that when he talks about himself as an apostle in 11. And then I also love 12. He says, for the which cause I do suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I know who I, sorry, I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against the, that day. This to me is Paul saying the same kind of thing that Nephi said. I know who I am. I know in whom I've trusted. Like, he doesn't have a stance of fear. He has a stance of power. Not because Paul is remarkable in any way, although he is remarkable. But that's not where Paul's confidence comes from. His confidence comes from Christ. Remember when we talked about this idea of like, you can have unshakable faith, not because you yourself are so strong in the faith, but because you have faith in an unshakable God? That's this. He's saying, it's not me. The reason I can stand here boldly and not be ashamed and not be afraid is because I have confidence in Christ. I know. In fact, I like that he almost teaches you the progression of how he knows. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The persuaded piece I loved. This is Paul saying like, I don't know everything for certain. This is how I read it anyway. He's saying like, I'm persuaded. There's so much goodness that I don't need to be afraid. The same way Joseph Smith could look at those plates and even though a portion of them were sealed, he could be persuaded that it's true. Even though he can't read it with his own eyes because he's like, there's so much goodness here and I've experienced the sacred grove and I've experienced revelation. Like I don't, I don't need to doubt and I don't need to be afraid. I know and I'm persuaded that God keeps his promises. That's Paul's teaching to Timothy. And then in 13, he reminds him how to get that same witness for himself hold fast the form of sound words. If we want to have the kind of posture that Paul has with a confidence in Christ, we need to hold fast to the word of God. 
the word that comes in scripture, the word that comes from living prophets, and the word that comes from the Holy Ghost, when those three intertwine, we have a, a sound word. And when you hold fast to it, you can gain incredible confidence in what he can do. Paul keeps the pep talk rolling into chapter two when he says, therefore thou, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I think Paul knows a couple things. I think Timothy's not gonna be able to do this on his own. This is a mighty work. And so he can't micromanage everything. He needs to call other men and commit them to live this gospel and to teach truth clearly so that they can be emboldened the same way Timothy is. And then they're going to have to endure hard things. He calls him a good soldier. I think it's Elder Hales that changes this to a good disciple. Like it's, he calls him to just be diligent in the work. And if he'll be diligent, then he has promises that are waiting. And that's what you find when you flip the page. So he says, for example, in 10, Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he also will deny us. Paul understands really clearly that to give your life in the service of God is the only way to actually gain it, to have something that lasts, is to just consecrate yourself to him and give it all. And then trust that the abundance that he is offering is worth it. The abundance that you get in this life and the abundance that awaits in the next one is worth it. And the opposite is also true. If we deny him in this life and try to create distance, then we're in that spot that the 10 virgins were when they finally get to the door and they knock and he opens it and says, you know me not. We don't have that relationship that he hoped we would build in this probationary state. And so therefore he can't offer the blessings he wanted to give us and prepared for us, which I think is a, a hunting warning of sorts. So he warns about how to teach in 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. The reason I like this is I think sometimes it's really tempting to perform our callings or whatever the Lord has called us to do in order to see results. So this is a natural tendency. It's really hard to stop. You know, if I have to plan a mutual activity or a girls camp or something, it's really easy to gauge my success on the number of people who showed up or how happy they are when they left. The same thing happens with me in my YSA class. Oftentimes I'll find myself beating myself up because the numbers went down that week or because half of the kids that I thought really loved it the week before didn't show up the next week. And I'm like, what did I do wrong? It's really easy to, to, misappropriate, you know, just like put my attention in the wrong place. When I put my attention up and I say, is this approved of you? You know, if I can kneel down by my bed and say, Heavenly Father, I did the best I could. Are we okay? Then he can make me feel assured no matter how many people were in the seats and no matter how many people come back next time. That's what I think Paul's trying to teach Timothy because his congregation is probably going to dwindle and it won't be Timothy's fault. He just needs to focus on, are you approved of God? Would he be pleased with your efforts? If he is, then you don't need to be afraid and you don't need to worry. And then he talks about warning. He talks about those who are going to overthrow testimonies. I think this is just, you know, this is Paul coming from a stance of experience to say, this is just what's going to happen and you need to be prepared for it, but you don't need to be paralyzed by it. So he warns about false teachings. And then in 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. No matter what the apostates say or teach, they might corrupt testimonies. They cannot corrupt the truth. They cannot change the doctrine. They cannot thwart the way of God. I love this from you know Joseph Smith's perspective of that, like this work is rolling forth and it will continue until it fills the earth. There is no stopping it from this point forward. And I think that's a sense of what Paul was trying to teach Timothy is like, hey, this is God's work and he can handle it. Don't be too worried. Um, and then he talks about what kind of vessel he can be. You can go into the notes and learn more about this. But I particularly like this idea of choosing what kind of vessel I will be, what I will carry, what I will hold. I think that's what we heard in conference a lot, this opportunity to use our agency to choose to be which kingdom of glory I want, what kind of body do I want, what kind of relationship with God do I want in the next life. That should determine my choices. I think that's, that's what Paul's teaching Timothy. 
choose what kind of vessel you want to be and teach others to choose it and they'll find power in that. I'll warn you, don't let yourself get swallowed up in the heaviness of the first few verses of chapter three. It's hard reading. It's familiar because we've heard it so much since it's mostly a teaching about our time. This is where he says, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. And then seven, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. And then he compares them to those magicians that were in the court of the Pharaoh. Remember when we studied this in the Old Testament with the plagues, and there were these magicians that could kind of do tricks, and eventually their tricks were exposed and dwarfed by the power that Moses could wield through the help of Jehovah. You know, this idea of their little parlor tricks fell apart compared to turning the, the, the Nile to blood or, you know, sending swarms and plagues and like all kinds of devastation in the land. It was dwarfed. And that's what he's trying to say. All those things, all that heaviness that you read in those first few verses will be dwarfed by the light and the brightness of his coming. That's what will it'll be very clear where the falsehoods were. So then he warns, you know, like in 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, and patience, my persecutions and afflictions, what came unto me. He's like, you know me and you know the doctrine. So you are on solid ground. The same way if you read in the Book of Mormon about that idea of being on that sturdy foundation, and no matter what winds and storms and craziness come your way, if you have built your house on that sturdy foundation, you have hope. That's what he teaches them. He's like, you don't need to be afraid of the storms that are coming. You are tethered. Remember, we talked about how covenants are kind of like that rebar connection, where that rebar comes up out of a foundation and gives you something to attach to? That's how I see covenants. Covenants are my way of holding tight to that solid foundation, so that no matter what the storms are, I can withstand it. And that's what Paul teaches. He's like, you're going to suffer persecutions. You're going to have struggles. Continue in the faith. In fact, I love that that's his word choice in 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And then instead of directing attention to himself, he talks about how Timothy learned this. And that this is in verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise. I think what Tim, or Paul is trying to teach Timothy is you've been learning truth from all these beautiful sources. You've learned them from your grandmother, from your mother, from me. Really where you've learned them from is from the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit has been teaching you and helping you understand every day of your life from the moment you were born with the light of Christ to when you received the Holy Ghost after baptism, you have been getting stronger. You know, and you are tightly tethered to this foundation. You don't need to be afraid. And then he teaches about scripture as a source of inspiration. There's a really good JST on that one in 16, so you want to watch for that. But I love what he, he teaches us about what the purpose of scripture is. It's what you see in 17, that the man of God be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Scripture is what corrects us. In fact, I love the way it corrects us. I listened to a podcast from Why Religion. If you haven't listened to that one, it's BYU professors talking about their latest scholarship and why they picked it. And I just think it's fascinating. One of the later latest ones I heard was about how we can actually learn better in scripture because there's like a degree of separation between us and the people in the story. Whereas if I got correction from like somebody close to me or a friend, I might bristle and reject it. But if I can read it in someone else's story and see that, oh, being merciful really did help the prodigal father. If I can read it in that story, there's a degree of separation. And then I can choose to be more merciful in my life easier than if somebody had just come to me and said, Maria, you should be a lot nicer. In fact, you should forgive. I, there's something about the way the scriptures give us that cushion that invites us to take on these Christ-like attributes without, without the bristling. And so I think that's what Paul's trying to help Timothy remember. Chapter four is probably the final writings of Paul, not just to Timothy, but of all his writings. And they include his final testimony. And it's short and sweet and wow, it's powerful. This is when he tells you that he has finished his race. And I just think it's, it's got so much depth in such a short amount of verses. He begins teaching Timothy again, preach the word. Remember this constant drumbeat of 
bring people back to the word of God. If they can get a tight grip on that iron rod, they can make it to the tree. So that's what he teaches them. He's like, forget the people with itching ears, which is a phrase I love. You know, it's people who want to hear the doctrine that they want to hear, something that's comfortable to them. They have itching ears for what is comfortable. The people who loved Korahor were all over this, right? They, they heard what was comfortable. And Paul's like, that's not you. Step away from all of that. And then in five, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist, meaning a teacher of people who are already baptized members, a teacher of people who are saints. Make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also um, to all them also that love his appearing. Isn't that a beautiful, succinct testimony? I think Paul's trying to say to Timothy, like, it's time for me to step down and it's time for you to pick up. You know, it's this shifting. I don't think Timothy is becoming an apostle in this moment, but I think he is trying to give him as much guidance as he possibly can. The same way Mormon has those last letters that are at the very end. Remember when we're on, I thought he was done, and then he starts to give us the letters of his dad, and you can't imagine the Book of Mormon without those letters. That's what these are. This, these are his final words, and I just love that he's at this place. I think it's the same place Joseph Smith got to when he realized his time was done, and he talked about being calm as a summer's morning. That's Paul. What I like about that for me is I was studying, so I was prepping for a talk that I gave in Pocatello about confidence in Christ. And I found this talk by Jorg Klebengat that he talked about, we can get to this point every day. Like we should be able to rest at the end of every day and feel reconciled to God. We shouldn't wonder if we're going to make it or not. We shouldn't wonder which kingdom we're going to end up in or not. We should, we should live our lives today with the intent to be exalted. And, and if we need repair and if we need help, we repent and we go through that process. In fact, we will for sure need, need help every day. And we partake of the sacrament and we begin afresh. And I just think it's this stance of, I know exactly where I am. Paul knows that because he's, he's got this relationship with the Savior and he knows how to, how to be strong. And he knows who he's trusted. And so he's at peace because he knows the grace of Christ. And he knows what he's done to try to show gratitude and love for that gift of grace. And so he trusts that, yes, indeed, he will, he will be saved and he will be exalted. And I think that, that final stance was powerful to me. I also love that he passes that confidence on Timothy. He reminds him of who he was and what he knows so far. And then I love what he says in 16. At first, my answer, at first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Similar to what the Savior said when his life was ending, his mortal life, he asked the Father to forgive them for they know not what they do. I feel like you get a little bit of that with Paul in 16. And then he says in 17, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear that I was delivered out of the mouth of a lion. I think Paul has a relationship with the Lord that is powerful and deep and abiding. It's how I felt when President Eyring talked in conference about his relationship with the Holy Ghost. It was so soft and so humble and so consistent. You know, he talked about how he, with a few small exceptions, has been able to have the gift of the Holy Ghost with him always. And I just, I, I, his stance of confidence there was so compelling to me. And that's Paul. And then in 18, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and shall preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What I like about the way Paul exits this, and you see it a little bit in 22 when he talks about having the grace of Jesus Christ with him, is he doesn't leave this life with saying to Timothy, I'll always be with you, or I'll always be in your heart, or you can always turn back to me, I'll, I'll, always, I'll never leave you. What he says is, Christ will never leave you. Jesus Christ will always be there for you. That's how I got through my life. That's how you'll get through it too. He doesn't, he doesn't try to hold on to this relationship with Timothy as Timothy's way to gain strength. What he says is, look to Christ. I think it's what all of us are supposed to do as we leave this earth. We have taught our kids so well the doctrines of Christ that we know that where they'll look when they need a remission of their sins, when they need help. That's what that's where we focused and hopefully that's where they will turn.
Okay, now we're gonna shift into Titus, but in my hopes of not making these videos 14 hours long, I'm gonna summarize some of Titus, mostly because it's really similar to what we just read with his guidance, Timothy in Ephesus. Titus is in Crete, and his job is to help the saints in Crete in a similar fashion, in some sort of stake type role or area role he's trying to help. So you're gonna see similar guidance from Paul about bishops and how to choose them, about how to help saints after baptism and how to strengthen them. And, it will feel familiar. So we're going to do all three of the Titus chapters back to back. Some key things that you want to watch for is you'll see that same direction to Titus to teach truth and to teach it clearly, to teach what the Savior would teach if he were here. So you'll see some of that. I do like his beginnings where he alludes to the pre-earth life. I like it because it reminds me of President Nelson where he said, the plan is fabulous. You know, that same stance of this is Paul. Everywhere he teaches, he's trying to help people understand the plan of salvation, that this world began way before, and that the plan is in place. The Savior came as a fulfillment of prophecy. Like, this is something that should be familiar to us. So that's what you see into, in the hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. These are some of the mysteries that Paul understands clearly, that these promises have been in place since before the world even started, before anything was created by God, this promise was in place. And that's powerful. Then he gives guidance about how to set things in order. Remember, that's Titus's role. His role is to organize and keep things in order, to love and show kindness, but also to correct when needed. The same way priesthood leaders today have to do this, right? What I like about this idea of setting an order, and we're going to talk about this in the object lessons as well, is I think there is an alignment that has to happen always. You know, as, as a leader in an area or in a stake type setting, Titus's job is to align with the priesthood leaders that are directing him, the keys that are directing him. So he has to align his word with what the apostles are teaching. They will align themselves with what the first presidency teaches in our day. There is a clear alignment that happens and it goes all the way through those priesthood keys. And so I think that's what Paul is trying to allude to. He's like, you need to set things in order, meaning check the alignment and make sure that we are that we are still focused on that cornerstone of Jesus Christ and that foundation of the prophets and the apostles that will help you know where to go next. So you see a lot of that in chapter one. When you go into chapter two, he gives some guidance about teaching sound doctrine. In Crete, in Ephesus, in everywhere, there will be people teaching false notions about salvation, about when the second coming occurs, if it's already occurred. All those rumors and confusions are starting to stir up Hearts. And so he gets similar doctrine taught here, that if you just go back to the word, go back and teach what the Savior taught, go back and teach what you read in the Old Testament, because that's all they had access to at this point, they can have confidence in the word. And so you'll see some of that, that he needs to know it for himself and carry it down. I also like what you see in four, where he talks about women being able to teach the next generation. I like this because of what we read in conference from I can't remember his name, his white hair. <laughs> he was teaching about how in King Benjamin's time, like one of the most sobering parts of the Book of Mormon is the kids who were there in the tents with the families and heard King Benjamin speak. By the time they became adults, they had lost that connection. They started to turn away from Christ rather, towards, rather than towards him. And so he was saying like, this is not something you can pass on like an inheritance. We need to be better teachers at home. And so you can see some of that in the notes, but I think that's what Paul is teaching Titus as well. Like you need to be diligent that this isn't just stopping with the current generation it needs to be passed on. He has guidance for living soberly, being a good servant and a good master, all those things we've studied in the past. Um, I do like his stance of looking forward in 13 of chapter two. He says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Peculiar is not odd. It means treasured, valued. So this idea of being peculiar and zealous of good works, I really liked because Paul's going to teach both. He's going to teach about the power of grace and that it is what saves us. He's also going to teach us about the power of good works and that that is how we show gratitude back to God. It's how we become exalted. It's our ability to refine and come closer to the kind of person he is in the process of this earthly life. So he'll, he'll mention both. Then in three, he gives the same guidance or similar guidance about being subject to, you know, principalities and powers in order to keep peace so that the gospel can thrive. People do best when they're in a stance of freedom. And so he's, he's pushing for that 
opportunity and be good in wherever you are, whatever place you're planted. And then in four, he says, but after the kindness and love of God, our savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. I think this is Paul trying to reinforce this idea of we are saved by grace. We didn't earn grace. It is a free gift given of the Savior from our Heavenly Father. It is a gift that is given to us. We don't earn it, but it is part of his plan. And we can show gratitude for it and become more like him if we choose to do good works, which is what you'll see towards the end of chapter 3. All right, you guys, we're in the home stretch. One chapter left, and it's a good one. This is Philemon. So this is one I hadn't ever studied in depth before. So this was all fresh and new and really, really good to me. There are lots of different ways to read this chapter. But for me, I feel like it's a chapter that teaches all about reconciliation. Our goal to extend mercy and love to others the same way we've been extended mercy and love from our Savior. And it's just got this beautiful message. So let me tell you some of the backstory. Essentially, there's a man named Philemon who is a worthy, good man. Sounds like he is a saint in the gospel. He is, you know, you can read the first seven verses and hear how good of a man he is. And he has been wronged. Um, basically, it sounds like what has happened is his slave or servant, depending on which scholar you read, escaped and left. And by Roman law, there's some consequences that come of that. If you're considered someone's property, which I know is offensive to our ears as it should be, but in Paul's day, this was kind of the social structure. And so that as he left, he essentially took something of Philemon's with him. Interestingly, where he goes, or at least where he ends up, is where Paul is, which is far off in Rome. And in the process of meeting up with Paul, this escaped slave or servant converts to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now things shift. It's really interesting to me how it plays out because Paul sort of acts as an intermediary. He writes the letter to Philemon to try to reconcile these two. And I found myself asking, why? You know, like, why do they even need to be reconciled? Why does this servant need to go back? Why? And what was interesting to me is to think about the temple recommend questions. You know, there's that question in our day about, do you have any financial obligations that have not been taken care of? I think maybe it's something like that, where in order to have a full fellowship and a full brotherhood, you need to reconcile. In fact, I think you see this even with the Savior's teachings in 3 Nephi, where he says, reconcile with your brother first and then come to me. I think this is a critical step when offense has been caused and maybe there was more offense than him just leaving. It's possible he stole things. I, I don't know the story. But if Philemon is as good of a guy as Paul is painting him, and Paul's a pretty good judge of character, then I think there's some deep wounds here. And so Paul acts as this middleman to say, would you consider forgiving? Is essentially. So if you look in the verses, he says in seven, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love, speaking about Philemon, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such as one as Paul the aged, and now as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul basically is saying, I am old and I've been serving for a long time and I'm a prisoner and I'm asking you, please extend mercy and forgiveness for this man. Because Paul loves him like a brother. He has converted to the faith. He has made amends. And now he's trying to repair. I liked, I thought it was interesting that Paul's the middleman here, because I think it's a little bit like what you read in the addiction recovery program. I was searching this this week and there's a step about reconciliation. And it talks about how if you've, if you've caused damage that would hurt others for you to approach them. You know, if you've hurt someone so intensely that for you to call them on the phone or for you to visit them would actually cause more damage, then sometimes an intermediary is necessary. Sometimes I wonder if that's Paul, if he's trying to help this man come close. And so he pleads with Philemon and he says to him, like, I could command this, I could guilt you into this, but I want you to do it out of love's sake. Because otherwise, the hostility will canker your soul. You'll get resentful, and I don't want that for you. So he says, I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus. I think that's the name of the slave or the servant. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but he says, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in times past to thee was unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. 
whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. Paul is saying to him, please take him back. Here's what I thought was fascinating, you guys. When I was reading this, I started to hear President or Elder Uchtdorf's words in my ears. You know the story of the prodigal and how he talked about the brother and how hard it would be? I started to think maybe Philemon is sort of like listening to what the dad would say to the other brother. You know, he's saying, your brother's home. I need you to love him. I need you to take him back. I need you not to see him as what he once was, but see him as he is now. Someone has who has come to himself. Someone who is ready to be different. And the brother is struggling <laughs> like we all would in that moment, which is I'm sure what Philemon is feeling. He's like, oh, there are big wounds here. I don't know if I can do it. And this is how Paul guides him through it. So he says in 14, but without thy mind would I do nothing. Meaning like, I'm not going to do this without you. I need you. I need you to feel this, Philemon. I'm not going to push this on you. That thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. I, I don't want to force you. I need you to want to forgive. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. Especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. I think what Paul's trying to teach him is the same thing that Elder Holland taught about reconciliation and President Nelson taught about setting down grudges. It's you yourself will be abundantly blessed when you step into the role that the Savior takes with each one of us. When you choose to forgive someone who doesn't feel like they deserve it or thinks they have no chance, you taste the joy of Christ. Remember how Elder Holland talked about that is one of the what he thinks will be one of the most profound joys of the Savior to forgive people who don't expect it <laughs> I just or show mercy to those who don't anticipate it. I think that's what he's inviting Philemon to be a part of. He's saying, you, you have a chance to taste what it is like to forgive and to be merciful. And please take that choice. Please accept it. And then he extends it one step further when he says in 18, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee, how thou owest me, even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. He's pleading with him to forgive the same way I think the Savior pleads with us to forgive. In fact, I think what is beautiful about the way Paul writes this is he essentially says, even if your heart can't love him yet, love me. I think it's the same thing the Savior teaches us. If we struggle to forgive someone for really good reasons, what he teaches is love me. Appreciate the gift that I give. Appreciate the atonement of, that I'm offering you and love me and that let that love spill out. Trust that I will judge all things righteously. I think to forgive someone doesn't mean it's done and written off and there's no consequence in heaven. To forgive means it's not on my shoulders anymore. It means I'm trusting that the Lord will you and the Lord will work this out, and it's not on me. I'm choosing to have a brother forever instead of a servant for a short time. Like that is what Paul's inviting him into. And I just think there's so many beautiful allusions to what the Savior tried to teach us. And especially listening to that story of the prodigal and his message of please reach out, please wrap your arms around him. I did. I gave him the ring, I gave him the robe. I need you to do the same. That I think is a really, really powerful picture to have in your mind as you study these words of Philemon. Hey guys, welcome back. This is the creative side of week 43. So this is where I take weird, fun, memorable tools to help your kids understand the principles Paul was teaching just a little bit easier. Like I mentioned in the past, this is not, uh, you don't need to accomplish all three of these or even any of these. I just hope they give you a creative kickstart so you know how you can teach the gospel in fun, creative ways. So let's get you started. For those of you who are watching on YouTube or listening on the free podcast, I'm just going to walk you through each one quickly. And then if you're watching on the course, you can just keep watching this video and it will teach you how to pull off each one and give you access to the printables and the notes so that you can teach these anywhere they're needed. Okay, first and foremost, it's almost Halloween. So since this week, we're talking about the spirit of fear and how God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. I thought it would be a really fun tie to connect it with Halloween. So for this one, you don't need any specific supplies. If you're in a family setting, I would encourage you to go somewhere in your neighborhood and find one of those houses that's got an amazing yard. You know, like find one in your neighborhood that's super spooky at night. And then I'll talk you through how to help your kids understand 
how God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. If that's not an option because you're in a seminary classroom or maybe teaching in Sunday school, you also could get a really um, convincing, maybe is the word, uh, Halloween decoration. So something that looks sort of real, like this creepy snake I have here, but actually isn't real. And then I'll walk you through the object lesson so that you can pull it off either way. But if you can get outside, I definitely recommend that option. Okay, second one. Much of Paul's writings this week are focused on how to solidify faith, that we need a firm grip on the iron rod. When we go back to understanding the word of God, we provide ourselves security and strength. Paul calls these sound words, and he often talks about how they are aligned. In fact, I think what he means with sound is that when you hear words from your prophets, they will align with words that you get in the scriptures, which will align with what the Holy Ghost confirms in your heart. We heard it a lot from a couple different leaders at conference, and I wanted to reinforce it with my kids. So for this one, you are going to make what I'm calling is a sound words spinner. Basically, you're going to mix up this little puzzle of sorts that you attach to a pencil and then help your kids solve it. And you'll teach them the principle of sound words in the process. So for this one, you just need the printable, a pencil, and a thumbtack if you've got one handy. You also could use this with just a brad and skip the pencil altogether, but I kind of liked having something to grip. So if you have those supplies, it'll be good to go on that one. The third one is related to our chart. So on the chart this week, it's our very last testimony week of this 2023 year. So since we started the year in week three with these bloom balls, I thought we'd bring them back this week, but with a different purpose. So a bloom ball, if you haven't seen these before, this is just a simple paper ball that you can assemble together. The idea of this bloom ball is that it is a testimony builder about foundations. I really like that this week, what Paul focused on is where Timothy got his foundation of his testimony. That it didn't just come from knowing Paul, it came from his grandmother and his mother and the Holy Ghost that's been with him from the get-go. And that was his foundation, and Paul helps build on that. He refers to it several times as a way that Timothy can find strength, because he can just look back and remember, no, I've been taught the scriptures all my life. So since I wanted to focus on that part of Paul's story, I created a ball that helps stimulate those kind of testimonies. So I'll walk you through this in the detail in just a minute. But the idea here is that all these questions prompt conversations and testimonies about where your testimony began, examples that you've seen, songs that bring the spirit, things like that, that will help you bring testimonies out of your kids without them even realizing it. So for that one, you just need the printable and then some, you know, simple like a glue stick works great. The other thing I was going to teach you is an easy way to select a person. So if you want to do this as well, then you're going to want to pick one of these poppets that I guarantee you've probably got 47 of these around your house somewhere. One of these little poppet toys and then either a marble or like a ball bearing. And I'll show you how you can use this to choose who's going to roll the ball first. It's a cool little, cool little trick that will come in handy. That's it for week 43, you guys. Okay, I know it's a ton to study, but thankfully there's a little bit of repetition. And if you go in the notes, it'll help you sort of see areas where you can dive in and areas where maybe you can just sort of gloss over because <laughs> this is a lot to cover in one week, especially for those of you who are Sunday school teachers who are trying to do this lesson and another one. That's a pretty big task. So open up the notes and see what, what will help guide your studies. If you need extra help, you're welcome to join me on Instagram. That's Monday at 10 a.m. That's when I'll talk through some of the things I didn't get to say in today's videos and then also answer any questions you might have about the insights. It's also a good place to ask me for object lesson help. So if you're curious about how to put together the bloom balls or how to use the spinner, that's a good place to ask me follow-up questions. If you can't catch it live, you're welcome to watch it in my feed for about a week and then it gets stashed away. So enjoy it if you can. Um, otherwise, enjoy your week, you guys. This is a huge week of study. So if you can't do it all, if I had to pick, like zero in on 2 Timothy, just cover those few chapters and if you can get those done, I think that that will fill you. It'll, it'll help give you enough to, to get you going. If you have time for more, I think you'll find incredible teachings in all of it, especially when you get into Philemon. I think there's beautiful teachings there. So if you have time, make time. And I promise the Lord will bless you. If you don't have time, do what you can, and he'll bless you as well. All right, you guys, enjoy your week, and I'll see you on Monday.